Hello there, I am the Common Sense Guy. Today we're going to be doing a video about a school, believe it or not, that is perpetuating so many different and wrong ideas. Haven't done any research or anything, but yet are still perpetuating the same ideas. Now, if you were to put this in reverse and put this into racism, or if you were to put this into actually attacking females or anything else like that, you can understand where the outcry would be. But because it's feminism that is now doing the reaching, so to speak, and coming out with forced lies, it's a case of nobody really cares. So I thought I'd do this video and just show where they're actually going wrong on this point. So without further ado, we're going to actually find out what this school is first. So as you can see at this moment in time, it says Lime Old Lime Public Schools. So obviously this is a point of people actually having a selection of schools. Um, what we would call a corporation of schools, possibly. But the one that we want is obviously the high school. So as it says at the bottom down here, it says Newsweek names at Lime Old Lime High School, fifth in state. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a quick look um, here. We're going to have a look at that one. See, there's a couple of schools that are actually there, virtual high school. Mill Creek School, Lime School, Centre School, Lime Old Lime Middle School, and Lime Old Lime High School. We obviously want the high school. That's the one that we're going to be looking for. That's the one that we're going to look at now. So we're going to click on that now. So, as you can see, we're now at this point in time looking at the different schools. This is the actual school that we actually want. You've got all the information that's all there. School times and everything else like that. So now we've had a quick look, let's have a look at general information and see if they have a, I don't know, mission statement for instance, shall we? Right, let's actually move on so we can actually get on with this video and actually show you what's actually wrong with the video. Okay. In 2017, not one country in the world can say they've achieved gender equality. Not one single country. Not even a country that considers themselves the biggest superpower in the world. It's a fact that less than 30% of males would consider themselves some consider themselves feminist, whether their viewpoints align with the cause or not. But it's their issue too. Society creates a stigma for men that it's less manly to be feminist, but again, it's their issue too. Feminism is simply the equality of the sexes. It's not women fighting for all the power to go to women or hating men, but unfortunately most people see it that way, giving it a negative connotation. But today I want to explain to you the true meaning of feminism and why it's important to use your voice to speak out. First of all, I don't know if anybody could actually hear that or not as it was uh, very, very low quality. I'm very, very sorry about that. That's unfortunately from the quality of the video when I first downloaded it. Nothing to do with my side on that one. She's making a issue of people not saying that they're a feminist, which is quite funny. She's basically trying to force people to say, well, if you believe this, then you're this. I thought that's what they didn't believe in. But whatever. She doesn't also include the fact that a lot of people nowadays call themselves a humanitarian or a egalitarian, as myself. Or even more importantly, people that don't actually align themselves with any political labels but yet still believe in the exact same equalities for everybody that an egalitarian would presume to think, or whatever. I thought they didn't like the labels. I thought that's the reason why they wanted to get rid of labels. So for this lady to come out and say that, oh, it affects everybody, feminism is, though it says in the dictionary that it is for the equal opportunity of both sexes to make them both on equal playing field, why is it that it focuses only on women's issues? If it's as egalitarian as it is, why isn't it called egalitarianism or humanitarianism, whatever word you want to use besides feminism? Some people would say that I would have an issue with this because it has a feminism in it. I do not. I not, don't have an issue with any sort of movement that is trying to increase females' rights. That's where the suffragettes come in. That's the reason why feminism come in to begin with. But if you're now trying to perpetuate ideas to try and say that women are not equal, then I disagree with you wholeheartedly on that point. And if you're trying to make things now more equal, surely you would go down the route of egalitarianism, trying to push more movements onto feminism while tackling more ideas on both sides, rather than just focusing on one issue. The fact that you call things feminism is the fact that you're focusing on one issue, meaning that you're not interested in equal rights or egalitarianism, as the saying is. It's very, very interesting and very telling to me at the beginning of this little 
PowerPoint piece that you provided here, trying to say that you don't think that people identify enough as feminism. Could that be that they've actually seen through the bullshit? Possibly. Let's move on. This is Santoya Brown. She was convicted of murder at the age of 16 for killing the man who bought her from her violent trafficker. The man who bought her was likely to have raped her, but Santoya stood up for herself. Instead of being considered brave and being honored, she's sentenced to a life in prison. For the last 13 years, Santoya has been sitting in a cell waiting for her 69th birthday to possibly get the chance for parole. She's currently 29. So, very, very interesting, isn't it? So this is the actual story that actually happened, I believe, in 2012. We'll get to that point in a very, very soon. This is the actual person who actually saw Sintoya actually at the beginning. And this is his... At 16, Miss Brown took the life of a 43-year-old real estate agent. Well, that's different to the trafficker that they were talking about, isn't it? Very, very different to the trafficker that this lady was talking about. She met at a fast food parking lot in in Murphy's Borough, Tennessee, south of Nashville, and who brought her to his house. Now, I'm not trying to say that this is a sexual transaction that's gone wrong, but could well be. It's been known for girls to go off at that point in time to be able to do stuff that they don't want to do, especially when they have a very, very bad history, especially mentally, as Miss Brown does have. But we shall carry on because that will be alluded to very, very shortly. Whether this was a sexual transaction gone array between a 16-year-old girl desperate for money and scared of being killed, or as friends and family of the victim have claimed, the slaying of a good Samaritan we will never know. I, I find it very hard to believe that this was just a process of a good Samaritan, but... I definitely can say that this is not somebody who was trafficking somebody as this girl who's trying to portray in the actual original video that we're talking about. It makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. But we shall continue and we shall learn a little bit more about this tragedy that so many celebrities and things like that are falling over to be able to get heard of. So let's carry on, shall we? What we know is that Johnny Allen was found in his bed, naked, and shot in the back of the head. And 16-year-old Brown was tried as an adult, convicted and facing life in prison. Now, the fact that he was found naked in bed, you have to remember where he actually is. He's in Tennessee. He's in Nashville. He's in a very, very hot place. A lot of people would be sleeping naked. That's not to say that something of a sexual nature was going to take place. And you have to ask yourself, why isn't the fact of where she was found, Miss Brown, where she was found and what her condition was? Now, I'm not trying to say that this is a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not trying to say that. I'm trying to stick to the facts. Getting to know her over a several month period was fascinating in that every meeting was like the first. One day she was lively, engaging and funny. The next, sullen, distracted and incommunicative. Hardly a remarkable description of a adolescent behaviour. What was striking and distinctive about Brown was her keen intelligence and high level of compassion, and how often it all seemed buried under chaos and confusion that Brown was damaged. It was clear, but how and why I never knew. So, at this point in time, he's realising that there is some sort of a mental issue at this point in time. So, he's now going to elaborate on stuff that's actually happening, what's gone on, what he's found out. And I'd like you to note the date on this point, in 2006. So we're going to just move down to this bit here. The film is not about retrying the case or implying innocent or guilt. It is about Sintoya and the complex and convoluted physical and emotional circumstances that resulted in a mental illness and one man's untimely death. And perhaps it raises an eyebrow about trying the most vulnerable of views in an adult system. Which I have no qualms about. I have no qualms about maybe she shouldn't have been tried as an adult and maybe she should definitely have been psycho-evaluated. But it just shows you the differences, doesn't it? Where this person is talking in 2012 trying to say that there was a mental issue behind this. Where now... You have feminists trying to say, no, this is just to do with the patriarchy because you killed a man for having sex, so this is all wrong. It's absolute bull, isn't it? 
absolute ball this this little bit here which will all be linked in the description all my citations are always linked in the description so please have a read so we're going to get on to the last little bits which is going to be talking about that i'm going to provide in this little citation but i just wanted to point this bit out because this is quite important the revealing interviews with brown's adoptive mother and a forensic psychiatrist unearth a side of brown that was never portrayed in the media Interviews with Brown's biological mother and grandmother reveal an extended history of emotional instability, including drug and alcohol abuse, addiction, and several generations of suicidal behaviour. Now that's a little bit, that's a little bit bad, isn't it? The fact that she herself has instability, including drug and alcohol abuse. This is for herself as a 16, 15 year old. And obviously in previous times has, and obviously as well in her family, having generations of suicidal behaviour, meaning that there is a mental health issue in there. There It could be a very, very strong one. But the most important thing that I wanted to point out is that talking to a psychiatrist, everybody has been saying that she is emotionally unstable, including drug and alcohol abuse. Now, that's what she could be using to be able to fund herself when she was talking to this guy. As I said before... I do not think that it was a case of any sort of form of trafficking, but I do think that it was a form of a sexual transaction that's gone wrong, on obviously the bloke's side. But I find that very, very interesting. Now, I'm going to provide, as I said before, this link in the description, but that's why I wanted to portray in this point to say that there is a, a mental issue. She should definitely not be tried in as an adult. I agree with that. And I definitely think that she should be tried as going to a mental health penitentiary rather than a penitentiary. Now, on that point, it still doesn't change the fact that she was, and she is, and she has been a good prisoner, so to speak, and has been able to live a normal life, so to speak, in prison. So the adjustments that she's done hasn't caused her any sort of strife to that point. She's still been arrested for murder and has been tried as a murderer and convicted as a murderer. So for anybody to come out and try and say different, like so many superstars have done, i.e. Rihanna, we'll get to that in a minute, has come out and said that she should be retried and everything else like that. Well, no, this actually says that she should be retried, but only in the capacity of maybe going to a mental health penitentiary instead. Nothing other. The fact that she has drug and alcohol abuse in her history in her history is amazing it's always amazing how stories get buried and changed isn't it when people forget but let's move on because i've been on this subject for quite a while now both men and women are sexualized for their appearances any man who tends to dress more girly is automatically assumed to be gay and a girl who tends to dress more conservative well yeah she's probably a lesbian and ladies don't let anyone know you have breasts because if you do well you're a whore there are so many stereotypes to the way anybody dresses, and it's simply unacceptable. Because one day, I might want to wear that little black dress and look damn good in it. And any other day, I might want to wrap myself up in an outfit that resembles a blanket. But either way, there's no realistic way you could assume anything about my sexuality through either way I may present myself. Right. Very, 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 very quickly. Um, that's a load of ball. Uh, right. This is from a good therapy, so a therapist section. This was from March 30th, 2012. The link between clothing choices and emotional states. Dressing up can take extra effort, but it also feels good, especially if you receive extra compliments. A new study suggests what many women have experienced. Dressing in nicer clothes makes you feel better. According to a recent news release, one study has shown that women who are depressed or sad are more likely to wear baggy tops, jeans, and a sweatshirt or jumper. Women who are happy or positive are more likely to wear a favourite dress, jewellery and jeans. These clothes choices seem to mean that women who are feeling down put less effort into what they're wearing. And women who are in a good mood tend to try and look nicer to match their mood. There were 100 women interviewed for the study and their ages range from 21 to 64. According to the new release, the researchers also found that 73% of women in the study shop for clothes at least every few months. The majority of women, of 96%, believed that they wear 
believe that they aware affects how confident they feel, according to a new release. So that's very, very interesting, isn't it? That women generally wear clothes to match the way that they feel. And the studies are all linked in the descriptions below. So feel free to have a read. There's also a hyperlink in the description as well for women who are depressed. That also is on the actual link itself. So please have a look, have a read. We're going to move on to the next little bit. So this is from psychologistworld.com. And this is about body language and the psychology of clothing, dating, dress. So, as you can quite rightly see up there, fashion psychology, what clothes say about you? So, as we go down, you needn't be an avid fashionista nor a London Fashion Week regular to be aware of how important our dress sense is to our reputations in the 21st century. The clothes we wear send powerful signals to our peers and strangers protecting the self-image of us that we want to display yet how many of us truly understand the psychology of how people in the street or office interpret our wardrobe choices and how this impression might differ to the one that we believe we're conveying to them well that's very very interesting isn't it very very interesting let's just read the next paragraph and then if anybody else wants to carry on reading it they can this is just to make a point that this girl is lying because she's done no fact checking whatsoever this is all opinion based rather than her actually checking any of the fact this is the whole reason why i did this video to prove the fact that the school is perpetuating these ideas without even checking any of the facts before putting the videos out there yes they can be proud of the students for putting their own opinions out there but not when it perpetuates ideas such as these but let's just do this last little paragraph an array of psychology surveys have revealed the true impact of clothing choices on the way in which we perceive and judge each other with experiments showing some surprising results, they even reveal how subtle varieties in dress sense can affect our ability to attract a partner whilst we are dating. That's that's very, very interesting, isn't it? Oh, look, defining stereotypes. Interesting, isn't it? Then we go a little bit further. Why clothes matter? What your wardrobe says about you? And this is all from an actual proper psychologist website that's telling you about the psychology of clothing so when this girl says that there is nothing that goes against stereotypes or clothing's just clothing no there's a whole branch of psychology that deals in this very interesting that you didn't even search this because you're adamant in your opinion is right does that mean that your opinion is right in everything interesting point isn't it one in four women will be raped oh my no god no, God, please, no, no, no! It is not okay to rape. It is not okay to rape. You all are probably thinking, yeah, no shit, we know. But it's been proven that the reason the rate of rapes is so high is because we do not teach that it's not okay. At least not enough. So I'll say it again. It is not okay to rape. So... If it's not okay to rape, then what about the actual fact that women also sexually assault men at a very, very high level? It's just to the point that men don't come forward about it. Is that the point that we should be trying to make them come forward as well? Or is this only about girls and girls getting raped? Or what about men that get raped? What about gay men that get raped? Interesting, isn't it? Because when a man gets raped anally, it's not classified as rape, it's classified as sodomy. Interesting, isn't it? It's interesting how you perpetuate this idea but haven't looked anything into it at all. And people know that it's not okay to rape. People know that for a fact. It's not a case that you're going to stop murderers from killing people. It's like you don't think that there's any form of judiciary system that actually punishes people that rape or murder or, or anything else like that. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It does. It's not that we perpetuate an idea of rape culture, is it, when we're actually putting away rapists? Uh, never mind. I suppose I better move on to uh, your next point. This is a video of my cousin, and she shared it in 2015. Well, she was brave enough to share her story and even come forward to the police, the reality is most people don't. So listen to every word she says. One in four women are sexually assaulted. 
I am one of them. A few weeks ago on a Sunday afternoon, I was drugged. I woke up the next morning lying in a stranger's bed, covered in my own blood. Unfortunately, stories like mine are common. Most girls and women stay silent because they feel ashamed, depressed, scared, or don't think they'll be believed. And a lot of the time, they are in denial. I am here to say that you are not alone. It is not your fault, and you deserve to be believed. As a society, we need to change how we treat people who have been sexually assaulted. We need to acknowledge the fact that this happens every two minutes in our country. We need to fight back against rape culture. Victims should not be blamed, disrespected, or discredited. First of all, I'm sorry that you had any experience with any sort of form of sexual assault or rape. I am very, very sorry about that. Now, to move on to your actual points, which I am very, very sorry about, as I said before, and being raped and everything, but your points are ludicrous. They are absolutely stupid. If you honestly believe that people were raped every two minutes, it just in the USA, that means roughly everybody would have been raped in their lifetime? That's how the maths would work out? That's interesting, isn't it? That everybody would be raped, even man, woman and child would be raped. Very, very interesting that. Even if you meant everything in the world at this point in time, every, somebody in the world was raped every two minutes, that's still an amazing statistic. But I'm sorry to say that that doesn't actually include the UK, the US or any sort of form of Western society. You could argue the fact that in Europe and European society, as that Western society, that rapes have gone up. Arguably, sexual assault in itself in Sweden has gone up by 300%. Admittedly, it's to do with more of how they interpret what sexual assault or rape is. You also bring up the point of the one in four. Now, I'm going to show you a Huffington Post piece that is actually one in five. Because you're trying to perpetuate the idea that around about 20% of the population is raped. Very, very interesting points that you're trying to make there. 20% of the whole population of the USA are supposedly raped or have sexual contact. So as you can see, this is from the Washington Examiner, and this states, no, one in five women have not been raped on college campuses. And obviously this is from August 13th, 2014. So let's get on to the actual story. So moving down. A shock claim that one in five women on college campuses have been sexually assaulted have been apparented by politicians, including President Obama, who are hoping to score points defending women in a supposed war against them. But in reality, this claim is misleading at best. Very, very weird, isn't it? Very, very weird that they would do that. But apparently, the paranoia it causes is just too good to let facts get in the way. So I'm going to debunk it again. The statistic comes from a 2007 campus sexual assault study conducted by the National Institute of Justice, a division of the Justice Department. The researchers made clear that the study consisted of students from just two universities, just two, just two, but some politicians ignored that for their talking point, choosing instead to apply a small sample across the US college campuses. Interesting, they portrayed it across all the college campuses. And now they're even perpetuating it even more to say the whole of the US. Interesting, isn't it, that? Let's move down just a little bit more. The CSA study, which actually... An online survey that took 15 minutes to complete and that 5,446 undergraduate women who participated were provided a £10 Amazon gift card. So they were enticed to actually take part in the survey. They were also provided money as well to participate in the survey. They'd also have to go and look for the survey as well to be actually be included. This wasn't a case of interviewing people on the street or anything else like that, but we'll get to that very, very soon. Men participated too, but their answers weren't included in one in five statistic. That is very, very telling, isn't it? You have this woman at the beginning of the video, the reason why I did this, that is claiming that feminism is about egalitarianism. It's about equal rights. It's about equalism. Well, it doesn't seem very equal to disclude or disenchant any men that come forward that were providing rape statistics 
for you because all you wanted to do was put down information to say that women were raped and how much women were raped by men. It's interesting how you want to skewer the actual results and things like that, isn't it? If 5,446 sounds like a high number, it's not. The researchers acknowledge that it is actually a low response rate. Another limitation to their CSA study inherit with web-based survey is that the response rates were relatively low, the researchers said. Although the response rates were not lower than what most web-based surveys achieve, lower than what we typically achieve using a different mode of data collection, e.g. face-to-face -face interviewing. As I just said before, you'd actually have more people in front of you rather than people coming to you, meaning that the results would be skewered. 19% of women who responded to the survey said that they had experienced some kind of sexual assault, either attempted or completed. 12.6% reported attempted sexual assaults and 13.7% reported completed sexual assaults and some women reported both. Interesting point, isn't it? Very interesting. Let's, let's move this back up to the top. Oh, we've gone past that point. There we go. But a lot of those responses have to do with how the question were worded. For example, the CSA study asked women whether they had sexual contact with someone or why they were unable to provide consent or stop or was happening because you were passed out, drugged, drunk, incapacitated or asleep. So that's very interesting. Drunk, which would be most of the higher stuff. Drugged, which can also mean that you've had been high on particular pills as well. So interesting points there, isn't it? The survey also asked the same questions about events that you think but are not certain happened. So obviously opinion. Now that's also a misleading question or a leading question, should I say. So interesting point there. So we'll carry on with this little survey, shall we? That's open to a lot of interpretation as exemplified by a 2010 survey conducted by the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which found similar results. Like that CSA survey, the CDC survey had a low response rate and non-representative sample. As Christina Hoff Summers of the American Enterprise Institute notes, no one interviewed was asked if they had been raped or sexually assaulted. Instead of such straightforward questions, the CDC determined whether the response indicated sexual violation, Hoff Sommers said. So, again, it's opinion and conjecture. This isn't an actual study that's actually provided any citations or sources, and the questions are misleading as hell. And this comes from a prominent feminist as Christina Hoff Sommers. This is not somebody that's like Sargon or anybody else that has a known agenda. This is somebody who is a feminist telling you, no, this is a lie. So we're going to move this back up to the top again. The CDC survey also asked a question about sexual contact while drunk, high, drugged or passed out and unable to consent. The question did not make it clear that it applied only to instances of unwanted sexual contact. Interesting. A leading question again. Now, 61.5% of the women the CDC projected as rape victims in 2010 experienced what the CDC called, quote, alcohol and drug felicitated penetration. So they had sex while they were drunk and high. Interesting. Hoff Summers said, if a woman was unconscious or incapacitated, then every civilised person would call it rape. But what about sex while inebriated? Hoff Summers continued. I mean, few people would say that intoxicated sex alone constitutes rape. Indeed, a non-trivial percentage of all customary sexual intimacy, including marital sex, probably falls under that definition. Interesting that Christina Hoff Summers was the one to actually say that, isn't it? A prominent feminist. Glenn Kessler of Washington Post, who fact-checked the CSA study back in May, pointed out that similar studies from 1997 produced different results, based on how the questions were worded. He cited an NIJ fact sheet, which noted that researchers had been unable to determine the precise instance of sexual assaults on American campuses, because the instance found depends on how the questions are worded and the context of the survey. 
that's very very interesting isn't it and just at the bottom there we just want to put that one out there and then we'll leave that to itself and actual reported crimes are much lower bureau of justice statistics data indicated that in 2012 the rate of rapes and sexual assaults was 1.3 per every 1,000 Americans aged 12 and up. Even though Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network estimates that 60% of all sexual assaults go unreported, the difference between actual reports and the off-cited study results in even greater, contrasting even more doubt on their veracity. Now obviously that's trying to say that the Rape, Abuse and Incest National Network that was estimated and provided this study that estimates that 60% of all sexual assaults go unreported is probably not correct. Because how could you estimate something on an estimate? It just makes no sense, does it? Just makes no sense. Rape culture is defined as a society that normalizes and dismisses sexual violence. And I experienced it firsthand. If sexualized violence was actually tolerated and there was a rape culture, as you're trying to insinuate, then why do we put people in prison for rape? Why is that there? Surely the perpetuation of the idea and the culture would be that it's okay to rape, so we don't need to put people into prison. Your premises are bought on false statistics and false opinions because of a skewed opinion and point of view. Now, I'm not trying to diminish the point that you've obviously had sexual assault or rape, but to the point that you're trying to draw this information from your own personal experience is the fact that the results will always be skewered because it's an opinion on what you're doing. Now, I'm not trying to belittle your opinion. I'm just trying to say that it will always automatically be biased because of unfortunately what happened to you. Well, that brings us to the end of the video. As you can see, I've tried to count that every single point by point. I hope I've been able to refute all of this. I will be posting on the actual YouTube channel that I got this from and actually posting it in a comment section. The only reason why I've done this is not because I want to attack the person who's done this, but I want to attack this school for actually allowing this to actually happen. Not because I don't think that people should have their own voice and be able to talk about it. Of course they do. It's a fact that they do not fact check what they're actually saying. They don't actually produce any citations for what they're saying and it's based in opinion rather than facts. If it was based in facts, I wouldn't be able to refute the actual points that were being made here today. So, on that note, I'm going to bid this person a farewell and adieu. And to all of my subscribers, thank you very much for taking the chance to watch this video. Please like and share this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this video and to this channel. Thank you very much for taking the time and I'll see you all again really soon. Bye-bye for now. Take care.